Okay, so this is the uh, second part of the video on how rockets work. Uh, so let's talk about Newton's second law. So Newton's second law um, is that force is equal to mass times acceleration. So Newton's second law basically states that the force is equal to mass times acceleration. Okay, and we typically hear this, um, that we typically see it as F equals M times A, or F equals M A. It's how it's typically stated. Uh, now, now, in the context of, of rockets, right, when you um, have a rocket, um, obviously, uh, the bigger the rocket is, um, you know, the, the more force uh, is going to be required to, to actually exert that rocket or get or get it to go in the air, and, and, and as a result, you will need to exert more force in the downward direction, and and and, and likewise, you, you have a lot of mass. So let's let's talk about what what's going to happen with the rocket and why F equals m a is relevant. So imagine you had a a, a rocket, and let's kind of draw it uh, down here. So let's see, you had, you had your rocket ship. Now, what's going to be happening is that um, the rocket are going to there're going to be some propellants inside the rocket, okay? And typically we're going to light those propellants effectively light them on fire. There'll be a fire coming out here. And the molecules um, of those propellants will will heat up. They're going to move around crazily and and um, exert a lot of pressure. Eventually that pressure is going to need to dissipate out the entry hole of the rocket and it's going to create a force in the downward direction. You know, what is, you know, how much force is being exerted downwards? Well, the way you can figure out it's actually the mass in this case, of the propellants, right? Of the propellants. Okay? Times how fast they're coming out, the acceleration of the propellants, okay? Okay, the mass times the acceleration of the propellants, and that's going to dictate how much force is coming in the downward direction, and that in turn will, will tell you how much force the rocket will be exerting upwards. Okay, so um, you know the more propellants you have, the more mass of the propellants, and, and the faster you can accelerate them outwards, um, the more force you're going to get uh, going in the downward direction. That in turn will dictate how much force goes in the upward direction, which in turn will tell you, you know how um, you know, how well the rocket will, will go into the air, or really clear the launch pad. Okay, now to me, I mean Newton's laws, uh, you know, again, uh, they're kind of the fundamentals of of what happens with with the rocket, uh, but really, th there's a lot more. It's actually involved in terms of being able to get a, a rocket ship in the air, um, you know, beyond just Newton's laws. And, and I think that Newton laws give you give you a good scaffolding, a good initial framework for talking about um, rockets, uh, rocket ships, and and and, uh, and rocket flight. But there's a lot more. So first of all, I think I'm going to talk about a few more things. So you know, one uh, one thing you got to pay attention to what's called internal pressure. So the internal pressure. Okay, of the rocket, the, the internal pressure produced by the, the burning rocket propellants has to be greater than the the external pressure that's being exuded upon upon the rocket. So imagine you've got the rocket here; um, the propellants will have some pressure here. Now, if this pressure is less than the pressure around, there's nothing that's going to force the the propellants out. If you're not going to force the propellants out, you can't get the rockets to go. So the propellants have to have uh, more. There's be more internal pressure being built up than there is external pressure. It's kind of like if you, you know, put a uh, a cork in a bottle. Um, you know, it, it would be you know you'd have a hard time getting liquid out of a bottle if there's already a cork in, in the bottle, unless there's a lot of pressure, which would cause the cork to pop and, and everything to come gushing out. Okay. Uh, the second thing that you've got to look at is the actual mass of the rocket. So the mass of the rocket. Which is which you can think of it is is kind of loosely how much it weighs, although weight and mass are really different things. But how much the rocket actually weighs, the mass of the rocket. Keep in mind that the the mass of the rocket is constantly changing. Okay, the mass of the rocket. The reason it's constantly changing is again when you when you when you look at what happens with with the rocket, the propellants are coming out of the rocket. The propellants actually weigh something. So as the propellants come out of the rocket, the mass of the rocket will decrease. And that in turn will decrease the inertia or the resistance to change in motion um, of the rocket, which in turn will increase uh, 
the upward acceleration. So in a sense, you know, as the fuel is burning and coming out of the rocket, in a way it's kind of easier to get the rocket up in the air because the rocket's lighter and, and it's got less inertia, and, and so it's easier to get it off the ground. Okay. Um, the third thing, is, let me just write that massive rocket is changing. The third thing to consider is that um, there's a lack of oxygen in space. So there's actually no um, or little to no oxygen when you when you go out in space. And why does that matter? Well, when you th we, it turns out if you've got a candle or, or just any kind of a flame, and there's no oxygen associated, I mean, if you kind of cover and smother a flame, um, let's see, you have a flame here, let's say, it's a candle. Um, if you were to have actually covered that candle up and and, and deprived it of oxygen, what's going to happen to the candle? Well, eventually, it was actually going to it's going to burn out. If you if you've got a candle and you cover it up and there's no oxygen. Eventually, the, the candle will just burn out, and the reason is that, is that any kind of a flame does need oxygen. Uh, now, likewise, when you start to go into space, this fire here will, will start to burn out because there will be no more oxygen left. And so, it turns out that a lot of rockets, and especially you'll, you'll see this in the space shuttle, they actually have to take oxygen with them to keep those flames burning. So, typically, the space shuttle, and, and if you look at the way the space shuttle is built, there's often this really big fuel tank um, that kind of is is with the space shuttle, it's almost it's actually probably about as big as the space shuttle itself, or if not bigger. Uh, and, the, and the space shuttle basically will will have uh, this kind of fuel tank with it. And this is a, a really bad rendition of the space shuttle, but there'll be a couple of rocket boosters. But the fuel tank that they, they have is often, uh, and that's such an oxygen tank. It contains liquid oxygen that, that is used to get the um, to keep the flames burning, so to speak, and, and, and allow the the rocket to get off the air. Okay. Uh, the next thing is that there's also kind of a fundamental challenge in um, being able to get a rocket off the air because of just the, the, the sheer amount of mass that you've got to deal with. And rockets are very, very heavy, especially rockets that have got scientific devices and, and, and instruments and, and things of that nature. And so one trick that's often used in practice is what are called multi-stage rockets. So the idea behind a multi-stage rocket is you'll have kind of several rockets nested within each other. and so. Um, in each rocket, each rocket stage will have its own fuel. So imagine you've got kind of one rocket here, and kind of inside that rocket you'll have, you can think of it as another rocket, which will have another rocket inside of it, and so on and so forth. And when the um, the first stage is kind of done with its fuel, it'll fall off, and that'll make everything else lighter. Everything else will become lighter, and then, then the, the next stage can, can come off, and so on and so forth. And at the end, you have a much lighter rocket, and, and lighter rockets have less inertia, so it's easier to get them off the ground into space. Okay, the last thing that you've got to consider um, when you when you're dealing with rockets is positioning. So, you know, rockets. Um, if you um, or it's kind of a if, you, if you're just a bit off balance or, or if um, or the rocket for some reason or other is just not in the right position or just gets a bit skewed, it can go all over the place. And so, rocket positioning is also very critical for being able to get a rocket off the ground. Uh, and the way this is typically done is that inside of a rocket, there's often a gyroscope. And, and gyroscopes are really neat. So uh, and let me give the word gyroscope. Uh, gyroscopes are really neat because gyroscopes are basically, you might have seen them, they're kind of these, these things that have like, you know, uh, different circles. And, but the, the idea behind a gyroscope is that regardless of how uh, uh, an external object may be moving, if you have a gyroscope inside that object, the gyroscope will continue to point the same direction if you kind of leave it free form. So imagine you've got a rocket. You might have a rocket, and let's say it's pointing in this direction. It's kind of pointing up and to the, uh, to the right here. Um, if you've got a gyroscope inside the rocket, the gyroscope will just kind of continue to point up. And now what can happen is you can figure out the difference. You can have an onboard computer that can look at what's the, what's the position of the gyroscope, what's the position of the rocket, and look at the difference between these two positions. And that'll kind of tell you which you know where the rocket is. You know, is it is it kind of off? Is it going in the right direction or not? And then you can you can use an onboard computer to actually calibrate or to steer the rocket in the right direction. And, and that's just something else you need to do in order to be able to get a rocket into space. And so really, you know, at the end of the day, I think rockets are, are pretty remarkable. You can you know obviously you can do a lot of really neat things with them. At, at their heart, you know, rockets really leverage the three laws of motion that Isaac Newton first postulated. Um, and the first law, recall, was that objects at rest must stay, must remain at rest, and objects in motion uh, remain in motion in a straight line unless they're acted upon uh, by an unbalanced force. And that's also known as Galileo's law of inertia, uh, because Galileo actually discovered that its initial principle of inertia. Uh, rockets also rely on Newton's second law of motion, uh, 
uh, which is a famous uh, force equals mass times acceleration, or F equals MA formula, and, and you need to worry about that because um, the, the amount of force being exerted in the downward direction is going to be, uh, you can compute that by looking at the mass of the propellants and multiply that by the, the actual acceleration of the propellants as they're coming out, and that'll tell you what the actual upward force will be. And the reason that's the case is it has to do with Newton's third law, which, uh, if you recall, is that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And ultimately, for rockets, that means that the force, um, the, the, that way to get that upward force, that upward trajectory for the rocket, is to be able to burn some propellant to create a downward force and then rely on Newton's law. And Newton's law will dictate that there will be an opposite force, which will, in turn, take the rockets upward. So that's, that's a quick um, introduction to the way that rockets work. I hope you enjoy this video. And uh, look forward to doing some more videos. Thanks a lot.